using the idea of cross products, we can take these two products and create a new equation that makes this proportion easier to understand. 3 times 3 is 9, which will be equal to y times 4, or 4y. This isn't an answer yet because y is not alone. So next, I'm going to want to divide each side of the equation by 4 to isolate the y. This will give me my final answer. 9 fourths is equal to y. Notice my answer is a fraction, and that's okay. We're going to leave it in its reduced improper fraction form since 9 and 4 don't have anything in common. Using the same technique on the second proportion, we're going to multiply along the two diagonals. Sometimes it really helps if you look at this in the two separate steps, showing my cross products. So x times 14 is pretty simple, that's just a 14x. Sometimes it helps to really see what's going on on that other diagonal. If I have x plus 2 times 10, that 10 has to multiply the entire sum. This is really a distribution problem. So I have 14x is equal to 10x plus 20. Now I can solve like a regular equation. I would like all of my variables on one side, so I'm going to subtract 10x from each side. That leaves me with 4x equals 20. When I divide both sides by 4, I can see that x is equal to 5. In this next problem, sometimes students get a little bit thrown off by that negative sign. So we want to take a look and realize there is only one negative on the left side of the problem. You can choose to see that negative as belonging to the 8, or you can choose to see the negative as belonging to the 11. It doesn't matter as long as you pick one and stick with it. I'm going to choose to let it belong to the 8. If you made a different choice, that's okay. We'll get the same answers in the end. So we start with 12 times 11, or 132, is equal to negative 8 times V, or negative 8 V. Dividing both sides by negative 8, We see that 132 is not evenly divisible by 8, but they are both divisible by 4, so we can reduce this fraction. So we're going to have negative 33 halves is equal to 8. In the next problem, we have one that doesn't immediately look like a proportion, so sometimes students panic over a fraction with variables in both the numerator and the denominator. But if you take a moment and you think about how could I rewrite this 5 so that this whole problem looks more obviously like a fraction, so remember that you can write 5 over 1. And now you have your typical a over b times equals c over d setup. So I can see that I'm going to have one multiplication problem here and another multiplication problem there. Sometimes it helps to see the distributions here. So we're going to have 5 times y plus 4 equal to 1 times y minus 15. And conveniently, the distribution on the right is pretty simple. On the left, we have 5y plus 20. On the right, we have equals y minus 15. If we subtract y from each side at the same time, we could also subtract 20 on each side. So we have 4y is equal to negative 35, and again we see we have a fraction that's probably not going to divide evenly. If I have 4y equals negative 35, and I divide both sides by 4, I can see that's not a fraction that can be reduced, so I'm going to leave it alone at y equals negative 35 fourths. Next we have a word problem. And we can use proportions to help us map and solve word problems, set up and solve word problems. If three apples cost a dollar twenty-five, how much will seven apples cost? There's a little note with this problem. This is when you set up your proportion, numerators should have the same units as each other, and denominators should have the same units as each other. There are actually some other options for how you can set the proportions up, 
but I find the idea of keeping things symmetrical is the one that most often makes sense to students. So if we think of apples and costs, we can say apples over costs will be our setup for each of the two ratios. And just like we've often defined our variables in previous problems, we kind of have two definitions here. One definition is how am I setting up my ratio? And the other definition is what is my variable and what should it stand for? So the question was how much will seven apples cost? So if I say x equals the cost of seven apples, I'll know what I found when I solve for my variable. So if my first fraction is apples over cost, see how I have three apples at a cost of $1.25? I'm going to say three over $1.25 is my first ratio. So my second fraction needs to be apples over costs as well. Now in my second setup, I know that I have seven apples. What I don't know is the cost of those seven apples. So we get an x in the denominator. But from here on out, it's the same as any other proportion. And we can go ahead and solve using the skills we've already learned. So I'm going to take two cost products. One for the 7 and the 125, and one for the 3 and the x. When we multiply them through, we see that 7 times 125 is 875, and 3 times x is just 3x. We can now come in and do our division to try to get that variable alone. So if I divide both sides by 3, I can take my 875 and divide that by 3. I'm going to get an approximate answer. I've got x is approximately equal to 2.91. Now, actually, I can switch over to equals if I allow for the repeating on the 6. So it's 2.91 and then 6 repeats. Now, we're talking about total cost and we're talking about going to the store. So we need to make sure that the answer we give is what would actually happen when we went to the store. We know a six is going to round that one up to a two because money is always rounded to the nearest hundred. So we can say that seven apples will cost two dollars and ninety-two cents. Following similar thinking, let's look at the second word problem. It says it takes you 12 minutes to go 2.5 miles. If you continue traveling at the same rate, how long will it take you to go seven miles? So if we think of what do we want our ratio to be? I see two units in the first sentence. I see minutes over miles. So I'm gonna be consistent and set both of my fractions up with minutes over miles. The question is asking me how long? Well, since my unit of time is minutes, that means in how many minutes. So I'm gonna say let m equal the number of minutes to go seven miles. Because that's what we're looking for. So minutes over miles for the known situation is 12 minutes for 2.5 miles. And my two fractions need to be equal to each other. So minutes are what I don't know this time. So I'm gonna leave an M where the minutes go, but I know miles is seven. When I do my cross multiplying, I'm gonna multiply the 12 and the seven, and I'm also going to need to multiply the 2.5 and the M. So I have 2.5 M is equal to 84. To get the M alone, I'm gonna have to divide both sides by that 2.5. And therefore, I can see that M is equal to 33.6 minutes. Now, that's a little bit of a weird way to talk about minutes. We want to remember that this is 0.6 of a minute. So, that doesn't mean like 6 seconds, because there are not 100 seconds in a minute. So, remember 0.6 of 60 seconds, right? That's 6 tenths of 60 seconds. Since 1 tenth of 60 seconds would be 6 seconds, this is 6 tenths or 36 uh, seconds. So 33 minutes and 36 seconds would be probably the best way for us to get our answer. 